Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat 120, featuring part two of my interview with the adventure game maestro, Josh Mandel. In this part of the interview, we talk about Josh's games, uh, Freddy Farkas, Frontier Pharmacist, as well as Space Quest VI. A lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Josh Mandel. So would you say the move from parsers to uh, point and click was a dumbing down of the genre? I felt that way, absolutely. Absolutely. There's no more room really for creativity in coming up with solutions. Uh, so one of the things that I did a lot of in Freddy Farkas, which hadn't been done in any of the point and click games before, was I tried to add a new facet, which was combining inventory objects. And all of a sudden you had a lot more possibilities, a lot more ways for the player to go, well, maybe if I do this with this, that will work. So I did a ton of that in uh, in Freddie Farkas, and I think that helped somewhat introduce the opportunity for creativity on the player's part in uh, solving puzzles. So speaking of Freddie Farkas, uh, Frontier Pharmacist, I mean the reviews for this game then and now are astronomically uh, good, and everybody seems to love it. Uh, 1993, I saw one description of it as uh, the quote blazing saddles of computer games. Right. Uh, that would was you agree either... with that description? Yeah, was a. Oh yeah. Yeah, that computer gaming absolutely. world, I think. That was either, um, it might have been Newsweek. Uh, I remember Newsweek had a little blurb about Freddie Farkas, just like a, a one paragraph or something. Um, or it might have been the New York Times. They also mentioned it. But uh, yes, we were painfully aware of Blazing Saddles all throughout the design and execution of Freddie Farkas. Uh, on one hand, uh, we wouldn't mind being compared to them favorably to, to Blazing Saddles. On the other hand, we didn't want people to f feel like, oh yeah, I needed to be very careful not to retread. Uh, we we're just like Blazing Saddles. We were focused on the cliches of Western movies, and Blazing Saddles hit pretty much all the cliches, didn't leave a lot of room. So we needed to take the same cliches and find a different way to, to poke fun at them. Uh, and I think, I think we largely succeeded. I don't think anyone played it and said, oh, it was, it was, it was too much like Blazing Saddles. We never got that. So I think we succeeded. So you, you co-wrote that game with Al Lowe. Right. Um, I, you know, I've interviewed him before. He's a, he's a really funny, laid-back guy. I was just wondering, what's it like? Uh, what was it like working with him on that game? Uh, he was funny and laid-back uh, most of the time. Um, Sierra had a very uh, well-developed star system, where they would um, they would take new designers like myself or Bruce Balfour, or Jane Jensen, or Lorelai Shannon. Um, they would have us do a game with one of the name designers. And then they would promote the game as being primarily from the name designer. Uh, because that way they could train a new designer but not worry about losing sales. Because they said, well, it's the new game from, from Lorelai Shannon. And everyone goes, I don't think I've ever heard of her. You know, so it would say the new game from Roberta Williams, but Lorelai would co-design it, or Jane, or so on. Um, Al uh, was going to be the name designer for Freddie Farkas, and he did do the, the, uh, the first design. Uh, it changed a lot between the first design and, and what was eventually released, and I ended up adding an entire act to it, basically uh, worth of puzzles. Uh, and doing most of the writing, but he was extremely giving when it came to my saying, I would like to try to do this, or I would like to try to accomplish that. If I could justify what I wanted to try in some way, if I could demonstrate that I thought it would be funny or people would love it, he would say, go for it. 
So he was very over. He didn't he didn't want to do a, the ballad at the beginning uh, with the bouncing ball. He thought that was a little cockamamie. And from a programming standpoint, it was cockamamie. It took the the programmers a long time to figure out how to get the bouncing ball to synchronize with the music. Um, but we tried it in the demo and it, it worked out really well. So we ended up doing it in the full game. And um, uh, I have no complaints about any ideas of mine that he tossed out. Uh, the one thing I wanted to do that he disagreed with was that I wanted it a little cleaner. I didn't want to do a lot of uh, uh, flatulence jokes or um, gastrointestinal difficulty jokes um, because I thought since this game is going to be primarily perceived as an Al Lowe game, wouldn't it be nice to break Al out of the the niche that he was in, which seemed to be you know sexual jokes and and fart jokes, um, and to show that he could do just as great a comedy that would be broad and hilarious and yet wouldn't go for the easier stuff. But he he was really fond of those puzzles, the uh, the fart puzzles and the. Uh, one with a horse yep. and a bag. Right. So so those stayed in, and I think um, they, as it turned out, they turned out to be some of the most memorable parts of the game. So you know, I I got to say he he was right. One of the things I remember Al talking about was they were he he never knew if the jokes that he put in the game would be funny, you know, because he'd look look at them again and again and again, and he never right. knew what to expect. Did you have that that same problem? Uh, to a certain extent, yeah. Um, and also when you're writing the quantity of material that I was writing for Freddie, I, I wanted every little item to have a message and every single inventory item with another inventory item, I used almost no generic messages at all. So there were tens of thousands of individualized messages in that. And when you write that much, you don't have as much opportunity, unfortunately, to edit because there's less time to go back and finesse jokes that aren't working out quite right. And there were definitely times when I said, I haven't. There were times when I'd write a joke, and even the third or fourth time I saw it, it made me giggle. And then I would say, well, I still don't know if anyone else is going to find this funny, but I think it's funny, so it's going in. You have to have some trust in your own instincts, and I, and I think Al has that trust in his own instincts. I was reading that there was sort of strange uh, that some of the jokes uh, that were on the floppy disk version were not included in the CD-ROM version. That just seems uh, really bizarre to me. Why was uh, what happened there? I was starting work on I think it was Space Quest VI when they finally decided to do a CD version of Freddy. Uh, with most of the CD versions. It was known at the time of development that they'd be doing a CD version, but with Freddy, they wanted to wait and see what the sales would be because it was a brand new series. Uh, so it was like a year after the game was released that they decided to start on the CD version, and I wasn't available to work on it. Al was, so Al went uh, Al went to work on it, and when he was actually in the studio recording it, he could see there were tens of thousands of lines that were going to have to be recorded here. And I think maybe after three, four days in the studio and seeing that they had a long way to go, he said, the heck with it, we'll, we'll leave some of these in just like in the text version or something like that. Um, unfortunately, when he mentioned that to me, I said, well, but do you realize that a lot of those thousands of messages that we haven't recorded they actually contain hints to the to the puzzles because I I usually thought the entertaining little quips should also help the player out a little bit in some way, try to lead them in the right direction. Uh, so they had to be left in. There had to be some sort of option to turn text on, and I'm not sure if they ever did or not, um, leave an option to turn the original text on in the CD version. So that's how that happened. Now you also did some of the uh, the voice work in the Sierra titles, uh, these talkies. Uh, what was that experience like? 
Well, uh, it was great. I mean, I loved the opportunity. I'd done a lot of acting. Uh, I had, I'd been classically trained. I had done voiceovers on some of the commercials uh, that I had done while in advertising. And I saw this as a great opportunity, and I couldn't believe that they weren't hiring uh, outside professionals. But then again, we were in Oakhurst, and the nearest town of any size was Fresno, 45 minutes away. Uh, so they, and, and plus there was a great deal of new expense in creating the CD games with the, the sound studios and so on. Uh, so the first one I think I did was probably King's Quest V and uh, uh, Roberta and Mark Siebert directed that and they wanted uh, King Graham to always be buff. That was That was like the line, keep him buff. So when I would try to make him tired or make him anxious or make him scared or something like that. They'd say, no, 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 no. It's King Graham. King Graham is never scared. He's never tired. He's always buff. So that's why that performance came out uh, in retrospect, uh, I think, very one dimensional. And I've always I've always regretted that it came out that way. But I tried at the time. Um, but then we started doing other talkies too. I did the, uh, monolith burger manager, um, uh, Jones in the fast lane. Uh, I love doing the voice stuff and I always look forward to the opportunity. And I did a lot on Laura Bow too, uh, with Bruce, who was very open to, um, trying new and, and interesting things with the voices. And of course he ended up marrying the woman who was, uh, the voice of Laura Bow. Do you think it hurt some of those games that they didn't get professional uh, voice actors? Well, I think it hurt them in reviews. I don't know if it hurt them in terms of sales uh, or memorability, uh, but it was certainly one area. I mean, the, the Sierra games were always so much more technologically advanced than most of the competition it was a shame to have voices that were not up to the other uh, production values uh, that the games had. That, that, that was a shame, but I also understand why it was done that way because these were enormous new expenses and the price of the games wasn't higher, but the cost to us to produce the games was much, much higher. So, uh, you know, we, we tried it and eventually we went with the professionals. Uh, we didn't have the advantage that say Lucas, Lucas had with having their own studios and, uh, uh, it was what it was and it was a sort of a necessary path, I think. I've always been sort of curious what it was like uh, with the, with the Lucas film guys. It's a competition it was, how did you play those games and see what they were like? Oh yeah, I love I love their games. Um, I thought that their games were generally uh, a lot tighter in terms of programming, um, and I say that not to anger any of the programmers at Sierra, who I thought did a spectacular job turning out turning out dozens and dozens and dozens of games. But I sort of resented Lucas because. Whereas their games were tighter from a programming standpoint and often from a design standpoint, too, I thought, well, they have the luxury. They have a lot more money because uh, of, oh, I don't know, that movie, that science fiction movie or two that Lucas made. They have their own studios and they only turn out a game, one game like every six months, even less than that sometimes. So I thought, well, gee, if we had that kind of luxury to work on a game, to only release one game or two games a year, uh, our games could be that tight too. Uh, but I, I love their games. I really looked up to their designers and their designs were solid. The voice work was great. I, I, I thought the world of them. And I, I never really got the sense that anyone at Sierra uh, didn't like them, didn't like Lucas games or anything like that. I think we all felt the same way that they, we turn out some great stuff. So do they. Uh, they're just very different. Uh, did you play Mist when it came out? Uh, for an hour or two. <laughs> you hated it, huh? <laughs> yeah. It felt, it felt really barren to me. Um, Were you surprised that it was such a huge hit? 
Uh, yeah, I think I was. I was a little disappointed. I think a lot of us were that um, a game could be such a huge hit and yet offer uh, relatively little interaction. Uh, you know, it kind of gives you the feeling that you're hitting your head against a wall when you're knocking yourself out to create fascinating characters and, and explore new genres and yet here's a game with no other characters in it and um, and no real responses and uh, boy that one's taken off yeah I was jealous let's move on then to pleasanter topics okay. maybe <laughs> I actually don't know <laughs> uh, but Space Quest 6 uh, 1995 of course, everybody knows about Space Quest. I mean, come on. Uh, so how did you get involved with this, and uh, what was your experience like working on it? Well, um, Mark Crow uh, moved to Dynamics at one point, and that was the breaking up of the two guys from Andromeda. That was after Space Quest Four. I had loved working on Space Quest Four with both Mark and Scott. They were, they were great. They were open to anything I wanted to try. Um, so... Ken started talking about what are we going to do for Space Quest V, and Bruce Balfour and I started generating game concepts for V, and one of my concepts was, I thought, I love Space Quest III. I love the fact that you had all these planets and you could bounce around between them, um, and yet I didn't want to do bouncing around between planets because that's what had been done in three and four. So I thought, what if we do an inner space kind of a thing like fantastic voyage. And instead of bouncing around from planet to planet, you bounce around from organ to organ and the organs are like planets. Uh, so that's where that came from. Um, but Ken really wanted to get dynamics up and running with SCI. So, and Mark was interested in doing Space Quest V himself. And since he was one of the real uh, two guys and they had a whole uh, company to get used to SCI, Ken saw that that was a natural fit. So Dynamics did Space Quest V. Uh, but he wanted Space Quest VI done back in Oakhurst, Ken did. So we resubmitted a lot of the design proposals. Uh, we tweaked them somewhat. And Ken picked uh, my inner space design. So I started working on that and I started working on the demo at the same time because as with Freddie, I wanted an interactive demo that would be different, completely different plot from the game, but yet would give you a sense of some of the characters and locations. Um, so that's how I got started on Space Quest VI. It was just that that Bill Davis, who was the creative director, and Ken, uh, and I'm sure Roberta had some say in it too, looked at the, the proposals. And the proposals were only like maybe a page in length. Uh, they said that's, that's the one we'll go with. And was it your idea to uh, let the player just immediately restart after dying? Um, that was... Uh, probably, I don't really remember exactly how I arrived at that, but that was probably my take on something that Al did with Freddie Farkas with the rewind button, um, where if you, if you messed up one of the, I think it was the arcade sequences or something, you could hit a button and immediately restart. Uh, so I think that was just my expansion of his original, uh, idea. For that. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Now I'm going to be taking a break this week, uh, next weekend. I'll be traveling to uh, Madison, South Dakota to present at a uh, academic conference there. So unless you're a student at Dakota State or in the area, it's going to be two weeks. So sorry about that, guys. Uh, the good news is uh, you can keep yourself occupied by going to uh, GOG.com and downloading Space Quest 4 through 6 all in a nice collection uh, for only 10 bucks. And I'll post my uh, referral link to that in the show notes. If you do want the games, please, uh, please use my link. Uh, it won't cost you anything extra, but I'll get a small kickback from that. Much appreciated. As always, I want to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Uh, that really means a lot, and it's uh, really wonderful that you guys are just as interested in uh, supporting uh, 
classic games and hearing from these uh, legendary designers like Josh Mendel as I am. So thanks very much. And as always, I want to leave you with a quotation from this time from uh, Mel Brooks. And it goes something like this. Good taste is the enemy of comedy. <laughs> See you guys next week. You guys like Italian? No. Yes. Yes. No. No. Yes. No. Yes. I love Italian. And so do you.